Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. We've got a very exciting series of Hangouts coming uh, out this month. What you may not know is that we are celebrating the Year of the Bird here at National Geographic. So 2018 is the 100th anniversary of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is one of the most powerful and important bird protection laws ever passed. In honor of this big birthday, National Geographic has joined forces with Audubon Society, the BirdLife International, and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to celebrate and protect birds for another 100 years. So to celebrate this at Explore Classroom, we're going to host a series of hangouts uh, with various scientists and other people who work with birds in the field. So I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. Today we're joined by Anusha Shankar. She's a PhD candidate at Stony Brook University in New York. And she studies how hummingbirds balance their daily energetic needs. And so she uses things like infrared video to capture their secret nightlife. And I think she has some pretty cool facts to share with us during the hangout today. She also is in a competition with her brother to see who can get to the most countries. And she's in the lead right now at 14. Her brother's at 10. She also loves salsa and swig dancing, photography, and reading fiction. So Nusha, it's so great to have you joining us today. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. All right. Well, we have a new feature that we're going to test out. If, if you don't mind, we're going to jump to a little map and we're going to see where everybody's located today. So it's pretty cool. Sounds so awesome. One second here uh, to share my screen. And it looks like we're all our seventh class joining us today as well, which is awesome. So, hey, Mrs. Dronkman's class. Um, sharing my screen now. All right. So this program here is pretty cool. This is National Geographic uh, Map Maker Interactive. So you should be able to see my screen now and you can see this X here. That's me hosting from Guelph, Ontario. If we slide down a little more, you can see Anusha here in New York. I believe you're on Long Island. Yep. Excellent. And then some of your field sites. So you do a little work in Arizona. So I put this nice fancy little circle down here over, oh, it didn't stay. Well, here's Arizona anyways. There that's was a nice little yep. uh, That's faded away on us. And if we scan out a little bit more, we can see Ecuador, which is another site of some of your field work. We've got a great group of classrooms joining us from different places uh, all over North America today. If we zoom in a little closer, you can see we have a couple classes joining us in Texas. We have a class joining us in Kansas, Illinois, uh, a couple classes joining us uh, from Ontario. And then we've got another class in Connecticut. So a great group spread all across the continent. All right, stopping the screen share. That's enough for me. Anusha, we are very excited uh, to learn a little bit more about you and what you do. Yes, yes. awesome. So, so um, uh, sorry, sorry, I can hear myself. Is that OK? Yeah, I can still hear you. OK. Um, first, before I start, I want everyone to think about how many hours they slept last night and just raise your fingers up for the number of hours you slept. I might not be able to see all of you, but OK, I'm seeing some sevens, eights, fives, tens. Some of you slept 10 hours. OK, and some of you are standing up, but I can't see your fingers. OK, so let's move on. Let me share my screen and we're going to talk about hummingbirds and their uh, nightlife. OK, and there we go. Is that good? It's come up, yep. OK, perfect. Um, so that's a hummingbird peeing. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why I know that hummingbirds wet their beds at night and why that's important to anything other than being fun to know. First, I'll tell you where I come from. This is uh, India on the map. And the pin tells you where Chennai is, which is where I'm from. That's me when I was about two or three years old, uh, playing with a camera case. And I was always a bit curious about things. Um, I also like to boss my grandfather around and teach him how to dance. And I still love dancing. And that's me being happy being outside on the right. Um, and this is where I am now. This is Stony Brook, uh, like Joe said, in New York, in the US. And here is where uh, I've come to do my PhD. And these are all the amazing people that I've got, some of the amazing people that I've gotten to meet and work with um, in the past five years on these projects that I'm going to talk about. 
So um, a lot of you must have parents or you must be wearing Fitbits to track how much energy you spend on different things. Um, and I want to know what, what energies, uh, what activities hummingbirds are spending their energy on during the day on different things. Um, but it's really hard to put a Fitbit on a hummingbird because it's way too big. It would probably just fall off uh, or fall across them. So we have other ways of measuring how uh, hummingbirds use energy. Um, so elephants, to go to the complete other side of the size spectrum, elephants are huge, right? They weigh like thousands of kilograms um, or pounds. And they sleep very, very little. Elephants can get by with uh, between no hours of sleep a night to two hours of sleep a night. Um, and so as you get bigger, if you're a mammal like we are, if you get bigger, you need less and less time um, asleep to function properly. Hummingbirds are tiny, right? And humans are in, in between. We, we need about seven to eight hours of sleep a night. And you guys just told me how much time you spend sleeping a night. Elephants need about two to three hours. So what are hummingbirds doing? They're really, really small. The average hummingbird weighs the same as an um, American quarter, a 25 cent coin. Um, so do they spend like all their time sleeping? Um, so we're able to go to the field to these different and amazing sites uh, and measure how much energy they spend on different things. These are some of our field sites, like we just saw. I, I go to Arizona to these deserts. And if you can see, there's tiny little red flowers in the front, in the near the front of the screen. And those um, are what hummingbirds feed on in this landscape. And then I also get to go to Ecuador, which is in South America, at these sites with the yellow pins. And we take some of our stuff up, stuff up the mountain on donkeys sometimes, and we get to see amazing views like this. So this is a cloud forest in a place called Santa Lucia in Ecuador. Um, and then if you dive down under the clouds, you can get to see scenes like this. So th these are hummingbirds at feeders, and I'll talk a bit more about feeders later. Um, but this video is, yeah. So you can see all of these hummingbirds buzzing around. They're using energy really, really fast. If you were using energy as fast as a hummingbird does, you would have to eat about 300 hamburgers a day to survive. So what are they spending all that energy on? During the day, they use all that energy to find flowers, um, to feed on this really sugary nectar, um, which is just sugar water, basically. And they use this to spend, to kind of fuel all of their daily activities. This is me and my friend and my field assistant eating a lot of pizzas to fuel our daily activities. We didn't eat all of them. There were more people eating this. Um, but this is human uh, consumption versus what hummingbirds do. But at night, um, hummingbirds can't see. And they can't get energy from this high energy sugar water from this nectar. So what do they do? They're still using up energy really quickly, usually. But sometimes they can use this strategy called topper, T-O-R-P-O-R. And what they do in topper is that they allow their body to get cold and they're not you know, generating heat inside to stay warm. And they're able to save a lot of energy by doing this. So when they're not able to feed and when they're not, they're not able to find flowers because it's dark, they can go into this strategy called topper. So we go out into those sites, to those beautiful places, and we can catch birds with these nets. They're called mist nets. And the birds look something like this. Um, and we're able to do three things with them to study their energy use. One is that we're able to use what's called an isotope um, of water. And we're, we collect their pee and see how much of this isotope, this chemical, is in their pee. And we get super excited when they pee during the day. You can see that's their pee right there. Um, and we're able to see how much energy they've used by collecting one pea sample one day and then letting them go and collecting another the next day. And the amount of change in that isotope tells us how much energy they've used in 24 hours. OK, so we know how much energy they're spending in a whole day. To see how much energy they spend on different activities, we use this uh, fancy piece of equipment which can measure the oxygen in their breath. And so this is kind of like a hummingbird on the outside putting its head into a little mask where we can pull air from its breath. And we can see how much oxygen is in their breath to see how much energy they're using. And we get fancy graphs that look like this. So just to tell you what's going on here, um, if you look 
the higher up the, the squiggly line is, the more energy the animal is using. And so at night, it, normally it's using a lot of energy. It's using a lot of energy. That's all the white stuff. And then suddenly, later at night, it drops down into using almost no energy at all. And that's the red line. And then in the morning, it comes back up to using a lot of energy, warms its body back up, and then goes out to fly and feed again. Um, and we're also able to use these fancy cameras to take a peek at that nightlife of hummingbirds that I was telling you about. So on the left side, you can see a student with a camera. And on the right side, you can see the camera pointed at a hummingbird. And I hope you can see that little hummingbird perched in there in that, uh, in that box. So at night, we're able to take amazing videos that look something like this. And I'm going to play this and hope it works. Um, so just before I start, you can see that the warmer colors, like reds and yellows, mean that the body's at a high temperature. It's really warm. And wherever um, there are cooler colors, the body is colder. Can you all see that, I hope? So this hummingbird is breathing. It's breathing really fast. And it's using up energy really quickly. Its body temperature is pretty high. Um, it's warmer than what your body is probably right now. And it's like moving around and shaking its body, keeping warm. And then later, when it goes into this torpid state, it's like that. And this is the same bird. And its whole body is one color. And it's almost the same color as the outside. And I'm going to play this video. And it's actually playing. And you can barely see anything going on. There's a slight change in color. But really, the bird is barely breathing. Um, it's not moving. It's not able to you know, do anything if a big predator comes and tries to eat it. So this strategy saves them a lot of energy, but it's also a risk because then they can get eaten up by other things. So we're able to see that there's this bird that's normal. And there's this other bird down here that's uh, normal at around midnight. And then later at night, poof, that bird almost disappears, the second one. Um, and it's in topper, whereas the first one is staying not using topper all night. And so we see how different birds go into topper or don't go into topper. And how much time are they spending asleep? Because when they're in topper, they're not able to get all the good benefits that come from sleeping, like you know resting and fixing up what's going wrong in your body and getting rid of all of these toxic things in your brain and things like that. Um, and they also do fun stuff. Um, like they pre this bird is asleep, its eyes are closed. And it's trying to like keep straighten its feathers and keep things um, straight. And then this bird is peeing at night. And this one's eyes are open, but there are other individuals, other hummingbirds that are um, peeing in their sleep. And this tells us that they're not in topper and that they are, they are asleep. Um, so we're able to uh, see how much time the birds spend in topper, how much the time they spend asleep and what they uh, put energy into during the day and during the night. Um, we found that hummingbirds only sleep, uh, they can sleep anywhere between 2 to 11 hours a night. Um, and the rest of it, they're spending in topper. Some, some hummingbirds are spending in topper. So um, there's a lot to find out about um, how are they able to get by with so little true sleep. And uh, then peeing at night uh, can give us hints about how they're managing their energy as well. So from small animals to big animals, it, I'm really curious to see um, how they spend energy asleep and awake. Um, and then I'm going to just end with a little bit about what you can do to see hummingbirds. If you're, uh, most of you in the US are in places where you can probably see hummingbirds at some time of the year or the other. Um, first of all, you should just be curious and ask a lot of questions when you go outside. And uh, to get hummingbirds in your backyard, you can plant all of these native hummingbird plants that will attract hummingbirds. Um, you can also put up feeders uh, where you can put one part sugar to four parts water, boil it and mix it, let it cool down, and then feed the hummingbirds with that. And they'll visit your backyard. Um, never use red dye because they can get really, really sick um, if you use red dye in your feeders. And make sure to clean them. You have to be really responsible about this, um, because otherwise they can get fungus. And then hummingbirds get sick, like this little one. And we'll all be really sad. Um, but then if you put to do all this right, you can see these amazing creatures in your, in your, own, very, um, in your very own backyard. All right. 
So I'm going to end with that, and I'll take questions. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. That was uh, really awesome. And I didn't realize that they could turn their bodies off like that. That's pretty incredible how they can go from active to just you hold that infrared camera to them, and it looks like they're they're done. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't think they'd come back from something like that. That's pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing adaptation. Um, quick question about the hummingbird. So obviously they use a lot of energy, so they need a lot of nectar throughout the day. Um, mm -hmm. How how long can a hummingbird go at full activity, say during the day without nectar? That's a really good question. Um, it depends on how big it is, how much uh, nectar they can store in their what's called their crop, where they can store nectar. Um, but in about a maximum of two hours, I'd say, on average, they can die if they don't get to eat. So they're, they're on a very tight um, budget in terms of energy. All right, excellent. Well, they are amazing, um, amazing, amazing birds. And I, for one, am looking forward to it warming up a little bit more in Canada so we get some of them coming back here. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's meet some classrooms. But before we do, uh, I can see we have classrooms who are watching online via the YouTube. Uh, channel. So there is a YouTube chat sidebar. Let us know who you are and where you're watching from, and we'd love to take a question or two. But for now, let's start meeting some classrooms. So I'm going to pull up my list, and we are going to start uh, with Mrs. Schaus. We're going to go to uh, Carrollton, Texas. We've got a grade five classroom. Let me turn their microphone on. Oh. Hold on. There we go. Hey, grade fives, how are you? Hey. All right, who's got a question? Anybody got a question? Okay. Why don't you come up closer so you can see it? Yeah, nice and close and nice and loud. There you go. Can you see her? Squat down. A yeah. Bit. There you go. How long a day do you study about hummingbirds? How many, like how many hours in a day? Yes. yes. When I'm in the field, um, my life is very different from how it is here. So uh, we can sometimes wake up at four in the morning to get up before sunrise. So because the hummingbirds are active as soon as it's as soon as the sun rises, um, and then we're catching birds and working with them. Um, sometimes we stay up all night. So it depends on what kind of information we want to collect. But sometimes it's like twenty-four hours. We Same take that. turns. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Right. Great question. So we're going to visit each classroom once and introduce them, and then we'll have some time at the end uh, to swing back for some bonus questions. So let's see. Let's, let's go to Connecticut, Connecticut this time. So in Connecticut, we have uh, Mrs. Craven's class joining us. There's fourth graders, but I have a feeling there's a few extras uh, in the crowd. It looks like a big group. So let me turn their microphone on. Hi, how are you? We have third How many classrooms, classrooms do we have over there? We have six classes with us here today. We have third and fourth graders. It's actually our entire class of third and fourth graders. Wow. Excellent. I remember your hands from before, and a lot of people had 10 hours up. That's a lot of sleep. Pretty lucky. We've got some good sleepers. <laughs> All right, let's have a question. All right, uh, Anna, did you want to ask your question first? Sure. Okay. All right, come here. What is your favorite kind of hummingbird? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, there are these tiny ones, which are like, I don't know, like the weight of a penny, and they have little boots on their feet. They're called the booted racket tails. Let me see. It might take too long to do this, but, oh, they're just so adorable. I have to show you. That's okay. okay. I'm going to share my screen really quick. Can you see that? Oh, oh. you see a puppy their feet are? I know, right? They have like little tiny white boots that you can see their feet and their little toes peeking out from the uh, from in between the boots. And then they have these long, thin black feathers called rackets. And they're actually really tiny. You can see two of them here. And two of them are a tiny little flower. So yeah, that that's that's my favorite one. Great question. All right, very cool. And I'm impressed that you had one. I thought 
that would get you thinking for a little bit. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's meet, uh, meet another classroom. This time we're going to visit Mrs. Jonkman. They're in Bowmanville, Ontario. So not too far from me, just over an hour. Um, but I need you to help me out. Your, your microphone's just off of my screen, Mrs. Jonkman. Do you mind turning it on for me? How's that? There oh, they wait. are. Hi, guys. Say hi, guys. Hi. Okay, Austin, come on over here and ask your question. Why do they go pee at night? Well, they're drinking so much sugar water. If I was drinking, is like they drink five times their body weight in sugar water every day, two to five times. That's imagine your size, and that's the size times five of you that you have to drink in water every day. You'd have to pee at night too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank All you. Right. That's pretty awesome. Um, we'll swing back to your class definitely for another question when the time. <laughs> We're going to go a little down the road uh, from you guys to Niagara Falls with Mr. Taylor's class. And let's see, Mr. Taylor has grade nines with us today. How's it going, grade nines? Very good. Travis, you had a question. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, how do they get out of Torpor? How do they get out of Torpor? That's a great question. Um, so if you, if you remember from that, that graph that I showed you, there was a huge peak at the end. And that means that they're spending a lot of energy and they um, even more energy than they would normally spend to like really warm their bodies back up. And so uh, sometimes if they don't have enough energy left, they'll in like a real emergency, you'll see that they can stay in top or they don't have enough energy to get out of it and they can die that way. So they have to be really careful, like thinking, managing somehow, getting into top so that they have enough energy in the morning to get out of it. And some people you'll see have to, like people post about this on Google all the time that, oh no, my hummingbird's in topper, it's not coming out. And they have to like physically keep the bird warm and bring it out of topper by helping it, by warming its body up. This is not something you should probably do, but um, yeah, they, they, they spend a lot of energy to warm their bodies back up. Uh, it's on one hand, it is a really amazing adaptation and obviously useful for their energy needs, but it sounds like it's risky too. It is, yeah. All right, let's meet another classroom. This time we're gonna go back to Texas with Mr. Kansas grade twos. They're joining us from Weatherford, Texas. Let me turn their microphone on. Hey, grade two. Hey. Um, what convinced you to be a scientist? Ooh, it's probably the toughest question yet. Um, I just love, finding out things. I love like asking questions about random things. Why is this like that? Why is that like that? Um, and really taking the time to find out the answers is really exciting. And this is like one hugely extreme version of that. I'm spending six years like asking very few questions about hummingbirds. Um, so yeah, I think it's curiosity. I just want to know how stuff works. All right, excellent point. That is the hallmark of a great scientist. Some people, when they have a question, they just go, ah, oh, well. But the good <laughs> scientists, they, they dig deeper and they find out. So that's a great trait for a scientist is that natural curiosity. All right, let's go visit another classroom. So this time we're going to go to Illinois uh, with Ms. Michael's group. Grade four is in Glenview. Let me turn your microphone on. How's it going, Glenview? Hi. And I want to tell you that the kids who are here were testing all morning, so they really wanted to hear you by staying in at lunch to hear you after they were testing all morning. So Thank here you. we go. Here's our question. My question is, um, how can the hummingbirds process all of the sugar and not get diabetes? Oh, man. You guys are so good at this. Um, this is a really good and complicated question. Um, whew, where do I even start? So they, we don't know. Let me just be honest. We don't really know how they do that. Um, but there's definitely something about the proteins and how their blood can tolerate. Like, so diabetic patients usually have too much sugar in their blood, right? And that sugar in their blood can affect the hemoglobin, which carries the oxygen in the blood. So there's this this pigment called hemoglobin, and it's carrying oxygen around and supplying different parts of your body um, with oxygen. And when there's too much sugar in your blood, one of the things that happens is that hemoglobin gets affected. 
it gets deformed and it can't do its its thing. It can't carry oxygen everywhere. And somehow hummingbirds, that doesn't happen to hummingbirds, that hemoglobin doesn't get messed up. Um, we don't really know. It's not studied well enough. Um, they don't have much blood, first of all. They're really tiny. It's really hard to study them. Um, but yeah, maybe you can find out one day. All right. The perfect thing for a future hummingbird scientist to set their sights on. It's finding out how they can do that. That's great. So don't let anyone tell you there's nothing left to explore or discover. There are lots of things you don't know. Uh, our final class who's live on camera with us is joining us from Garden City in Kansas. They're grade nines with Mrs. Navi. And let me turn your microphone on. How's it going, grade nines? Hello. Um, how many different types of hummingbirds are there? All right. Did you hear that one? Yeah. How many, how many different types of hummingbirds are there? Um, so usually we call them species with different animals that, that are different types. And this keeps changing. Like we don't even know how many species of animals there are in the world. Um, but hummingbirds right now, we think there's about 336 species according to the latest count um, and the US gets about 16 of them uh, they're not always here because they come up only when it's warm in the summer in some places you see hummingbirds year-round like in California and in Arizona and Oregon but here on the East Coast for example there's only one species that comes up just in the summer to breed and have babies and then go back um, down to Central America and Ecuador has about 150 they have the second highest number of hummingbirds in the world after Colombia, which has more than Ecuador. All right, and with hummingbirds being such small animals, I bet for sure there's many more species still to be discovered. Maybe. All right, awesome. Well, we visited all of our classrooms for one go around, so we've got to meet everybody, but we do have some time now, so we can open it up to a few more questions. So if you just wanna give me a wave at the camera, that'll be my signal that I need to visit your classroom again. And uh, I can see Mrs. Michael's class already doing some waving for me. So we're back in Illinois. All right. John Clark. Um, an uh, what is an estimate of how many hummingbirds um, it would take to uh, for, an, for the weight of an elephant? OK, I'm going to pull up my calculator and do some quick math. <laughs> All right, our group in Illinois is definitely very interested in hummingbirds. No question. Two times a thousand times a thousand. I don't even know how many thousands to include. Like, how many pennies would it take to make up an elephant? <laughs> I think two million. Oh my gosh. Something like that. Or two billion. I don't know. I have to think about this. All right. Well, that's a good little math activity for later is pick a few, pick the biggest species of hummingbird and the smallest species and see how many pennies you need to make them weigh the size of an elephant. That's a good little science math activity. Our math class today. All right. Great question uh, from a group in Illinois. I can see the testing didn't tell you out too much. All right. So give me a wave at the camera. Oh, there we go. Let's go back to our group in Connecticut. Our grade threes and fours. Your microphone is on. All right, Jack, what's your question? How long do hummingbirds use torpor? How long do they use torpor? Um, it kind of depends on a lot of things. So some of them don't use it at all because they're really, they're kind of bullies. Um, and they're able to get like special access to a bunch of flowers in the evening. They eat a lot in the evening and then they can just get through the night without going into torpor. Um, and then there's other ones which are really tiny and they, they, they get bullied out of the flowers. And so they they can't eat that much. Um, and they can use, depending on how long the night is, they can use topper for two, two hours to 11 hours. So it depends. All right. Great question. Uh, Mr. Kantz in Weatherford, your microphone's on. I see someone waving. Um, are you interested in other animals? <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. I actually never wanted to work on birds. Um, I was really interested in insects and snakes and uh, lizards and all these things that people find really gross. I wanted to work on all those things. Um, so, yes, I'm definitely interested in working on other animals. It's just hard to focus on too many of them at the same time. 
All right, great question. Uh, Niagara Falls, Mr. Taylor just sent me a message. They have a question, so your microphone is on. It's okay. Oh, let me try again. It should be. Let's see. Can you okay. hear? Okay. We wanted to know. We're about to have the bell. I hope the bell doesn't go. We just want to know how did you pick your sites? It seems like Arizona is a desert, but then when you're in South America, you're in like a rainforest or a, or a cloud forest. What's your reasoning for picking those two sites? Um, so I think it's really that's a good question. It's it's really um, useful to see how hummingbirds will respond to different environments. Because with climate change and with so many extreme temperatures and rainfall and all these things, it's good to understand how hummingbirds behave in different environments. So it's really useful, especially to have these extremes. The desert's really hot during the day and cold at night, and it's really dry. It's uh, the way the plants are distributed is different. And then exactly in the cloud forests, um, and we also do some studies at the high elevations in the Andes in Ecuador. Um, we can get how they respond to all these different environments. And Ecuador has such a huge concentration of hummingbird species that it's a really useful place to get a lot of species and see how different types of hummingbirds respond to those different environments. OK. So really quickly, Mrs. Schaus's group says they have to go to lunch, but I see someone at their camera. So let me see if we can squeak their question in. Is there a, honey, is there a hummingbird that can camouflage? It can camouflage. Um, a lot of them are really green. Oh, 850,000. Camouflage. 850,000. Okay, so I think their strategy is that they fly really fast and they're green. They, they can get eaten sometimes. Um, so the babies in the little tiny nests, they're like the size of a, of a jelly bean, the eggs, they can get eaten. Um, they just they they have so little energy in them that there's not much point hiding okay. as much when they're adults. Thumbs up. Thank you. It's a good question. Thank you. Mrs. Jonkman's class, let's check in with you guys. Do you have another question? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Why do, can't they see at night? Ooh. <laughs> Why can't they see at night? Well. <laughs> The easy answer is that they don't have the right cells in their eyes. So you have rods to see at low light, and you have cones to see color. And hummingbirds will have a lot of cones because they can easily find the red flowers and pink flowers that they feed a lot on. But they don't have their rods, which are supposed to be able to see um, better in the dark, don't work that well. Thank you. All right. They need uh, to be able to see those bright colors. That's pretty important. Yeah. All right, we'll check in with our grade nines with Mrs. Navi just to see if you have an ex uh, one more question. Um, do hummingbirds have any like predators? Predators? Yeah. Do hummingbirds have any predators? Um, so, yes, um, there are, you know what raptors are? Like eagles and hawks, um, even crows can feed on their eggs. But usually it's all when they're really small and helpless and they're in their nests. Um, snakes can also eat them. The adults, I've actually seen some adult hummingbirds chase away bigger birds. And they can get pretty aggressive, so they can do it the other way around. Yes, but when they're babies, they can get they can be really vulnerable to get eat, getting eaten. And then I've definitely seen some images of praying mantises. So. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know how that happens, but somehow praying mantises sit at feeders or at flowers and they're able to just catch these hummingbirds. Yeah, it's incredible. I guess they're fast. All right, another round of great questions. So we have about five minutes. So I still see people up at cameras and I still see lots of waving. A few classrooms had to duck out for lunch, but uh, there's definitely still some more questions. So let's, if you're up for it, let's go around again. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go back to Connecticut first this time. Threes and fours. Your microphone should be on now. Um, why don't we have Penny? Can you talk really loudly? Eight hundred fifty thousand question. That's where we one hour. What colors can hummingbirds be? They can be so many different colors. There's the greens are really common. But let me see if I can find one of this really ridiculously colored. Really ridiculous. 
there. They can be red. They can be black. They can be here. This is an amazing picture. Can you see that? Look at that picture. Oh, wow. Crimson topazes. Oh, wow, yeah. It has yellow and red. Um, and then there's, oh, these are one of my favorite colors. Um, we had these at my site. It's called a shining sunbeam. And it looks really like boring and brown until you look at its back, which has a whole rainbow on it. Wow. Look at that purple. Yeah. Can you see that? Very it has cool. green and red and yellow. Never like anything yep. ridiculous. Any other things? Excellent. Uh, give me a wave if we have another question from another classroom. There we go, Mr. Kansas class, back to Texas. <laughs> right. How big are hummingbird eggs? Hummingbird oh. eggs, they're like jelly bean size. They're probably that big. <laughs> and how long does the mother have to oh, just attend wait. to them? How long is an average uh, before they hatch? That's a good. That's a really good question. I think it's about um, fifteen days. So they're really completely useless. They don't have any feathers. They can barely see um, just when they're born. And you can find videos of this. People put up cameras in their backyard on nests. Um, look on YouTube, and you can see how they grow and become a little bit bigger, and then they start to try to fly. Um, I think it's about 15 days. All right. I'm a little nervous to go back to Mrs. Michael's class. They've had some pretty good questions. Oh. Yeah. All right. It's me again. Yeah. Um, what is the average lifespan of a hummingbird? Excellent question. Um, usually when things are that small, they, they use up energy so fast and they die quicker. Hummingbirds live pretty long. Um, the average hummingbird lives about seven years. And there have been birds that have been found 12 years old. So they're able to put a little metal band on their legs, like aluminum band, and they catch them year after year. And there's some that have lived 12 years. Wow. All right. And let's visit our grade ones one more time, just in case they have another question. I see waving, so they must. Come on. Where do hummingbirds in Ontario go for the winter? Hummingbirds in Ontario. Do you know, Joe, if they're ruby-throated ones? We definitely have ruby-throated ones, yep. Um, so they go usually to Central America. They're in like Mexico and Panama. Um, and that's where they, they spend most of their year. Butterfly migration. Yeah, it's, it's All right, excellent. Since you had a question, when uh, just building on the question about your field sites between Arizona and Ecuador, do you see a difference in the amount that they use uh, torpor? Is it is it different between the two spots? Because one of them is much warmer um, during the night. Yeah, um, I thought there would be a much bigger difference, but there isn't. Um, there, even though it's about, I am so bad at converting to Fahrenheit, but the, it's about 23 degrees Celsius, which is like a little more, a little more than half your body temperature, I guess. Um, and they're using topper as much uh, as the, the Arizona side. So again, it, it depends more, I think, on on their how big their body is, how much energy they're able to store, and how much of a bully they are. All right. Well, Anusha, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun today. A lot of good information about yeah. hummingbirds. The classrooms all came through with awesome, awesome questions, which is always Maybe. great. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you kicking things off for our Year of the Bird hangout. So it was great to have you joining in. And how can you skip hummingbirds? I'm glad we, <laughs> glad we had a good hummingbird talk. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you all for attending. This was so much fun. And you have amazing questions. All right, let me turn their microphones on. We'll let them say goodbye and thank you. So it might get loud in here. So here we go. Microphone's coming on. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Excellent work. They're all really good at that part. So once again, Anusha, thank you so much. That was a ton of fun. And classrooms, thank you so much for tuning in and thank you for your great questions. But uh, we are going to sign off for today. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.